Well, good evening and welcome to each of you. 59 is our first requested song. Number 59. sing. Thank you very much for that special. 180 is our next song together. 180. Yeah. 
682. 
282 is our next song together. If you're able, we invite you to stand while we sing number 282. Yes, but if Bobby Miller, if he'll lead us, please. Thank you, Father, for this evening. Thank you for watching over us throughout the day and giving us back to your house tonight. We thank you for the houses and come and worship you in. We thank you for.
for these songs and the messages and the moments. May we always be wanting to draw nearer to you, to grow in your word, to become closer to you, and to look to you for all of our needs, all of our guidance, and our understanding. We pray that you would be with us as we go throughout this week. We do pray for the family that has lost a loved one. We pray that you would comfort them in their hearts. We pray for those who in the family who may not know you as their Savior, that this would be a time for them to reflect upon their lives and look to you. And we just thank you very much for um, the opportunity for, for Audrey to be up with you. And we just thank you for your son and sending him so that we can have that opportunity when you come again or our family comes. We just pray that you would be us safely again throughout the week. Thank you for all that you have blessed us with. We pray that you would bring healing to those who do need it. Forgive us all our many sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. There's a song that says how beautiful heaven must be, and I'm convinced that the music in heaven's going to be glorious too. 
I, I don't think there'll be a piano made in Japan up there, but at least there's going to be some beautiful singing and praise unto the Lord. Um, singing and praise to God has always been a something that the Holy Spirit can use. Um, I know the night that I surrendered to preach, I was ready after the song service. I felt that that was God moving my heart in such a way, so uh, we do really appreciate those that give themselves to doing a good job for us in the music department. If you want to open your Bible to Isaiah, the 30th chapter, uh, all we know at this time is that Audrey will be, uh, the service will be here in town at Davis Turnal, Turner Funeral Home. But we don't know any detail yet. They don't either. So uh, keep the family in your prayer. I'm sure that as uh, Christian people, you have, um, you know, you're hopeful and you're thankful that your loved one is with the Lord, and yet you still have to deal with the human side. And so keep them in your prayer. Time change Saturday. We want to set our clocks forward an hour before we go to bed. And also keep uh, Billy and Dolores in your prayers. Uh, they always can use a little help in that, that department. Well, tonight we're dealing with the will to serve. And <clears throat> we want to read uh, about four verses here in the 30th chapter of Isaiah, beginning in the 18th verse having a lot of sinus troubles tonight, so uh, you hear a lot of sniffing and snorting. <clears throat> it's probably coming from me, and hopefully you don't have that problem. But Isaiah <coughs> chapter 30 and verse 18, it says, And therefore will the Lord wait, that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted, that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment, Blessed are all they that wait for him. For the people shall dwell in Zion and Jerusalem. Thou shalt weep no more. He will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer thee. And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner any more, but thine eyes shall see thy teachers. And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is a way, walk ye in it, when ye turn to the right hand, and when ye turn to the left. So when you think about the will to serve, the, the word will means the power of choice and uh, the ability to take, uh, to take action by uh, that will. We know that God created man with a free will, Man could make up his own mind, and of course we do it all the time, and we make up our own mind in what we're going to do. God also gave man the powers of intellect to where he could act intelligently uh, according to knowledge with his will. And God saw to it that man would have the proper knowledge so that man could will to make the right choice and the right action. And we see how that worked in the book of Genesis chapter 2, and we're going to go back there for just a moment, uh, how that God had given them a will and how that they were free to act with that will. And in the third chapter of Genesis, <clears throat> we notice um, that with knowledge and with a free will, God left man alone to make his own decisions. And here in Genesis 3, and verse 4, the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day you eat thereof. Your, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Now we know that story very well, but God had given them ample knowledge to where that they knew what would be right for them and what would be wrong, and also told them the consequences of being wrong. So when the devil was uh, speaking to Eve and she was processing this in her mind, then when she starts to go in, in, the, uh, in the direction of, of partaking of this fruit, 
God's not in the background waving his arms. Don't do that. Don't do that. He wasn't there. And uh, <clears throat> God uh, was, did not make some lightning and thunder to scare her to where she would make the right decision. God did not cause, and you could think a whole lot of things that could have happened to distract her from doing this. He didn't cause the fruit to fall off the trees to where that she would be afraid uh, to make a wrong decision. Now, that may sound a little corny, but I think you'll be able to see where I'm coming from. In the 12th chapter of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 12, and there in verse 38, in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 38, then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the, jo of the prophet Jonas. So the one and only sign that Christ ever gave was that he would be in a tomb three days and three nights. Jesus did not give signs to get people to make up their minds. He gave them the truth. And like I say, this was the only sign that he ever gave. But otherwise, it was just the truth. He would give them the truth, and then they would be left to make up their own uh, choice with their own will. So I think we can all ask ourselves a question here. Why do we need something else to convince us to do what we know is right? Why would we need something else to move the needle when we know what is right? <clears throat> God is not going to give us any signs beyond the truth. In the 16th chapter of John in verse 13, it tells us that when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. So the truth is what the Holy Spirit uses to lead and to guide. He doesn't use something phenomenal beyond that. In the first chapter of Galatians, when Paul was uh, relating his account of having been called to preach, in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 15 and 16, he said, But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Paul knew that waiting on something else to convince him what he should do would only become a distraction to him. And he said, I eliminated that immediately. I conferred not with flesh and blood. He just responded to what God wanted him to do. It's the flesh and blood part of us that wants something else besides just what we know God wants us to do. And of course, the flesh will produce all kinds of things. It will produce fear. It will give us doubts. It will give us misgivings. It will give us desires that are contrary to what God wants. And of course, you can go on, just endless things that the flesh can produce that will become obstacles to us doing what we know God wants us to do. And uh, that's what the scripture refers to of the flesh lusting against the spirit. But I want to notice something with Elijah back in 1 Kings chapter 19. In 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah had, <coughs> had uh, performed a marvelous ministry in Israel and we're not going to go into that story. But <clears throat> after that uh, he had, had performed it, I'm sure he probably thought that he brought Israel to a good place. And then the next day, a death warrant was issued for him. So it really took the wind out of his sails. But I want to read in verse 11 of 1 Kings 19. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. Behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains, and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. So think about that for just a moment. Elijah did not get any directives from the wind. 
He didn't get any idea of what God would have him to do from the earthquake. Nor did the fire reveal anything to him. It was a still, small voice. Just God speaking to him. That's where he got his, his directive for what God wanted him to do. Take you back in history a little bit. I remember over 55 years ago, sitting in a business meeting in Moore's Fork, and they had started the mission here, and they were going to call a pastor, and guess who they called? They called me. And sitting right there in church, uh, the whole church was there, and so they, they said, we, we have felt led to call Robert Miller to pastor the mission at Lynchburg, Ohio. Boy, you talk about a life-altering decision that had to be made. That was it. And you know what? I wanted a wind. I wanted an earthquake. And I wanted a fire to move me to show me what to do. Because it just, it was such a tremendous uh, uh, impact upon me at that time. But you know all there was? Just the call to serve. That's all there was. There was nothing else. One of the big issues that weighed on my mind, I did not want to say no to serving God. I knew that was not right at all, to, to say no to serving God. Plus, I didn't want to let the cause of serving God appear to be something that would be inferior to my choice. Whereas if I was to refuse to say, well, I don't think I'm the man for the job or I don't think it's right for me, you can imagine what the conversation would be around the dinner tables of uh, all the people there who were in that business meeting. Well, I wonder why he didn't want it. And, uh, you know, people would say, well, it looked like maybe that he felt like it was beneath him and he had something else he would rather do. I did not want it to look like in the minds of people that a call to serve God was not a top priority. So that was there. And the other thing is, I had already surrendered to preach a while back. So if you have, I've surrendered to preach. I said the Lord's called me to preach. And you've got the opportunity to preach. Then what else is there? You see. It wasn't that I needed a fire and a wind and an earthquake. It was just, it came down to this. Did I have the will to serve? That's what it came down to. So, the flesh did its part, I'll assure you that, but so did the spirit. And uh, finally it just came down to that. Do you want to serve or don't you want to serve? And that's what I had to make the choice on. The flesh will never quit. And that's why Paul said he didn't want to confer with it at all. Because it's not going to quit. It's going to blow its, uh, its, its loud trumpet all the time. Well, moving on beyond that, in 1971, our uh, mission was organized into an um, autonomous church in January of 1971. So about six months later... Half of the people were gone. They had left. <clears throat> there was a number of reasons, but the big reason was that our church took a stand on morality with uh, some of the uh, members, and a lot of people didn't like that. So at that point, we were down to about 18 people. Uh, there was Mrs. Hurt and her kids, and there was Bill Osborne, and there was myself, and there were some others, uh, but down to about 18 people. You know, that was pretty discouraging at that point to have it come to that. It just looked like, hey, nothing's going to work here. So the flesh again, and of course the devil always gets in the picture. And believe it or not, here is the one thing that he offered me. You know how people rejoice when a person gets saved. If a person says they've been saved, but they suddenly come to the realize they're not saved and they get saved, everybody's so happy that they got saved. So here's what you can do, Bob. You can say, 
I've never been saved. Now I'm accepting Christ as my Savior. Everybody will be happy now that you're saved, but that will relieve you from being a preacher because it was all done before you were saved. Well, that was what the devil put in my mind that I could do. But the spirit was there. You know, here's what I want to say about that. You cannot build a future on a lie. You can't do it. So I knew that that would be a lie. I knew that could not work. I also felt a responsibility to the people who stayed. I felt I just can't leave them hanging here. And my wife, and I had at that time two kids. I think two, maybe three. But anyway, three maybe. And I thought, I need to be true to God for them. You know, I just can't opt out on this thing. Because I've got a family. I've got people depending on me. I've got family that, uh, uh, that needs me. So again, what did it come down to? Do you have the will to serve? That's what it came down to. And as I look back over my entire life, and going back prior to even being called to preach, there were a lot of crossroads. You know, life has a lot of crossroads. And I know uh, choices I had to make in school, choices I had to make when I was working. And it all came down again, do you have the will to serve God? Or will you give in and let something else take over? Well, today with my age and horsepower, it's still the same. Do I have the will to serve God? It hasn't changed. Is still on the same question. So how about each of us tonight? In 1 uh, Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12, and I think this is, this is a verse that we all ought to really uh, challenge ourselves with. In 1 Timothy 4.12, it says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. So look at that responsibility. Exampleship. Exampleship. Showing other people what it is to, uh, to really struggle and strive and go ahead and have the will to serve God. It's not about our circumstances or what other people do. It always comes back to the question, do I have the will to serve God? That's what it comes back to. Now I want to go to Hebrews chapter 4. This is a very important information for us. And show us how that the Spirit of God will make the way for us if we have the will to serve. Because Christ made provision for that. And here in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens... Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with a feeling of our infirmities. Don't ever forget that. You're not alone. Whatever you're feeling, the Lord knows all about it. And so it says, He was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. And there's two important things here that we want to point out. First of all, that we may obtain mercy. What do we need mercy for? There's a part of us that doesn't want to serve God. There's a part of our, us that will have all of these reasons why we should, should not serve God. Well, I need mercy for that one. Then, find grace to help in time of need. That's for the part of us that wants to serve God. So Christ made provision for all of it. Now, nowhere does the Bible say that there's going to come the day when we'll be such a spiritual giant that the battle with the flesh is all going to be over and that we can just uh, wait a while and all of our clouds are going to pass away and it'll all be clear sky and all, everything just exactly the way it should be to serve God. Romans chapter 7 Romans chapter 7, and I'm, I'm really thankful for that chapter in the Bible because it really tells it like it is. Um, 
It tells you about the fleshly side and what it's doing. And then, of course, being born again, having a spiritual side. But here in Romans 7, 22, I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members. So here's the flesh, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am. Have you ever come to that conclusion? Boy, I'm not much of a Christian. I don't feel like a Christian today. So, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we cannot put off serving God to a future time. We can only serve God in the moment. God says now is the accepted time. And let me give you an example. If you were dealing with a lost person and they were at the point where they were ready to be saved, they were under conviction, but they were to, to start talking about they had come from a family of a different religious belief and you know there would be a lot of people that wouldn't understand if they was to accept the Lord and serve the Lord and then they might even have a spouse that would not really be in agreement with that would you tell that person wait to be saved then until your family and your spouse and everybody agrees that you should be no, you wouldn't tell them that. You would be going against the work of the Holy Spirit because now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. So we need to apply that to our spiritual decisions. In Hebrews, the third chapter in verse 12, Hebrews 3 and verse 12, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now, let's, let's say that you, all of us, have somebody you love. It might be your spouse, hopefully you love them, and children and other people, but... Do you find that it's easy if somebody you love walks up to you and says, I would like for you to do this? You say, no. No. It's not easy, is it? And if you have said no to somebody you love, that hits you right here, too. You feel bad about that. So what I'm saying is, when we say no to God, we're affecting our heart. We're affecting our own heart if we say no to God. So uh, for our will to be correct in serving God, we must act upon the knowledge that God gives us about serving him. And that's what we find back in Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 21. I want to connect with that verse again. It says, Thine ear shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it, when ye turn to the right hand and when ye turn to the left. Now, it didn't say you're going to get a feeling. It didn't say that. It didn't say you're going to get a sign. It didn't say that there's going to be an extra beautiful day. But the word, the word, the word that you hear. So if we will, for the matter of serving God, God's word will be the lamp to our feet and the light to our path. I cannot tell you in a few moments we have here tonight everything that you need to know about serving God, but I can tell you how it works. And how it works is, if I really want to serve God and will to do that, God's word will be a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. It'll make the way possible. So in 1 Samuel 15, 1, one of the things that God emphasized to Saul, which he did not hearken to, he said, Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. So we must seek unto the word to be our knowledge for our will to act. Now I want to go to something else that we can relate to in Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, and there in verse 5, <clears throat> Ecclesiastes 8, 5. Whoso keepeth the commandment shall feel no evil thing. And a wise man's heart 
discerneth both time and judgment. All right, we're going to do it the other reverse. We're going to do the last first, judgment. What if there were no standards for judgment? Just think about it for a moment. If there was no reference for a judgment at all, you could not know what is right versus what is wrong. You would never know what you should do or what you shouldn't do. Now, boy, that would be really a, a bad place to be in if there was no judgment. But the same thing goes for time. What if there wasn't any such thing as time? Now, that may stretch your mind a little bit. It did mine. Of course, mine's about that long. But to think about if there was no time, how in the world could you get along? It would just be chaos. You'd apply for a job. Somebody says, you got the job. When do I start? I don't know. If there was no time, think about it. If there was no reference to time, think about how chaotic. So we have to know when for our will to act correctly. That's why we have clocks. And, of course, if you have a clock, you want an accurate one. You don't know, one that uh, tells you a lie about the time. You also have those personal timepieces. I don't know whether a watch would cover them or not, because some of them do some weird things. But you have those personal timepieces, and uh, you, you carry them so you can act as you need to act. But neither a clock nor a watch will do us any good if we never reference it. So if you're running along, and you look at your watch and you discover, I'm late. What is your reaction then? Do you get mad at the watch? No. You appreciate the fact that you have a reference that is accurate that can inform you of what you need to know to make adjustments to where you can be, where you need to be at the proper time. You also know it would be a foolish thing not to pay attention to your watch or your clock and miss everything. So I would like to make a comparison uh, to our scripture back in Isaiah chapter 80 and, or Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 21. Thine ears shall hear a word behind thee saying, this is the way walk ye in it, when ye turn to the right hand and when ye turn to the left. We need to consider God's word to be our spiritual judgment and our spiritual watch. God's word needs to be that. We should value it and want to look to it so we can make the necessary adjustments in our minds to where that we can be in harmony with God, to where our will will be able to put us in harmony with God. We should believe that God's word is a more accurate reference for our life than our watches are. We should really believe that and have that confidence. And so <clears throat> that's why God is saying, my word will be there. You have the will, my word's going to be there for you. And it'll guide you. If you get off one way or the other, it'll tell you which way to get back. So let's just say that you give somebody a very expensive and accurate watch, but they never use it. They're always late. Well, I think that probably you would be a little frustrated with them. If you gave them a good watch and they're always late, they never miss their, they always miss their appointments, you would probably feel like pulling your hair out and you look like me. But think about that for a moment if you did not use it as it was intended. God has given us a watch. He's given us a book full of judgment. And you know, the eyes of heaven see us. And God knows whether we're using it, whether we're letting that word direct us, or whether that's not where our will is. Our will would be somewhere else. So we have to, his word to show us how to exercise our will. But I want to just put one other statement with it. A choice to serve God will only be as effective as we take our stand in serving God. If we do not stand 
in our service to God, then we can say, I want to serve God all day, and it won't do us any good. We have to act upon our choice and opportunity to serve the Lord. May we bow our heads for prayer. Father, we thank you that you have given us life, and you have given us opportunity, and we know we have your word to show us the way, and we have a will that you have given us. And so I pray that as we go through life, we would know that you're watching us, you see what we do, and you are well aware of what your will can accomplish for us in life and what it can mean to not only ourselves but others. And so we just pray that we'll ever be conscious of the choices that we make. Then we pray most of all that it would be in our heart that we would want to serve you. So may you give the invitation and thank you for your love and comfort those who are in sorrow at this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Let's stand while we sing.